The following podcast contains spoilers and words such as done and bother. Mate, did we watch a thing this week? Yeah, we did. Hello, everybody out there in podcast land. It's Billy and Topha. We're with you again, and we are looking forward to this one. How are you, my friend? I'm okay. Yeah. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How, how have you been? You, have you been up to much? I, I haven't spoken to you in a while, I feel like. You know, there's nothing going on. You know there's nothing going on. <laughs> I guess, especially now that sports is back, I guess in your household there's really nothing going on. It's just watching people throw around pigskin. That's it, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Although we both planted a tree yesterday, did we not? It was it the same kind of tree? Did you end up going a Japanese maple? <laughs> yep. <laughs> What uh, what variety of Japanese maple did you go with? Ours is a Shana. I believe it's a red dragon or something. That is a sick name. <laughs> yeah, that may have had something to do with the choice. <laughs> so did you go with- Oh, wait, no. Maybe we went thinking we'd get a red dragon. And, oh, I, can't, I don't know. It's a fucking tree. Is yours a dwarf or did you go a full size? Mate, I don't think they like to be called that. <laughs> Looking forward to our trees racing. See who gets bigger. <laughs> Ours, I, I, ours is very small to start with. Ours is maybe about eighty centimeters tall. Yeah, probably. Yours might yeah. even be a touch bigger than ours. Yeah, right. See, and because winter, of course, it's it's got no leaves on it. No, bare as. Yeah, it's, at, at the moment it looks kind of ugly. I'm like, well, why did we plant this? <laughs> <laughs> why did we spend this much, dude? How much do trees cost? Yeah, I know, right? They're not cheap. And then by the time you buy like the the nice soil and stuff for them as well, because our block here is all just clay. But we're not um, we're not talking about trees this week. <laughs> you you haven't accidentally joined. We gardened a thing. <laughs> not yet. Not not yet. That's future spin. We're waiting for sponsorship. <laughs> yes. As is customary on the show, though, we do watch things. And what did we watch this week, my friend? Um, upon request from <laughs> frenemy of the show, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, you messed up, Daniel. <laughs> we've watched 90s um, world famous B movie, <laughs> Basic Instinct. Yeah. Now, Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> I'm I'm going to use your full name here. Daniel, right? <laughs> you're not Dan, you're Daniel because you fucked up. <laughs> Is, uh, I have a bad memory. Was it also Daniel who requested Child's Play from us? That is correct. The yes. the new the new one. Yes. He I I feel like Daniel has to have steered us right at least once, hasn't he? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I very much doubt it. All right. So basic instinct. I I'm I'm guessing we have Two kinds of patrons. We have those who seem to hate us, <laughs> and then we have those that want us to usually watch things that they genuinely enjoy. I get the vibe here that Daniel actually does like this movie. I think you are correct, yes. And look, we've kind of spoiled it with our talk so far. We maybe didn't like this movie, and I feel like we're in the vast minority here. But, I mean, in our defence, only because it's hot garbage. Well, yes, it's- <laughs> Absolutely. Like, it's steaming hot garbage. It's garbage. <laughs> <laughs> it's fancy garbage, mate. Um, yeah, I hadn't seen it before. And I correct me if I'm wrong, you also hadn't seen it, had you? Had not seen it. Right. Well, I apologise to good friends of the show like Sam and, and Paul from The Countdown. and But we, we didn't, I didn't, I didn't like this. I didn't like this one bit. No, but only because it's terrible. It's totally terrible. Basic Instinct is a 1992 neo-noir erotic thriller film directed by Paul Verhoeven, written by Joe Esterhaz. Film follows San Francisco police detective Nick Caran, who is investigating the brutal murder of a wealthy rock star. It stars Michael Douglas, Sharon Stone, George Zunza, and Gene Triplehorn. Nick Caran is the it's the garbage pronunciation, <laughs> is it? <laughs> Not Nick Curran. (laughs) Nicholas Curran. I'm trying to bring some life to the show, mate. Okay. Do you know what does bring some life to this film? Um, What? Not Michael Douglas because he's like a thousand. (laughs) It's the opening credits with the the TriStar Pegasus. Oh, that was the best. I do enjoy that. (laughs) That was my favourite part of the movie. Yeah. Was the TriStar Pictures Pegasus. Takes you back, doesn't it? It's like when you- Yes, it does. I thought I'd rented a VHS. Yep, yep. It's like when you see the like the old Universal logo and it just brings you happiness. 
you're right. Um, unfortunately, then the movie started. <laughs> yeah. Wait, uh, just on on how good is Orion? Whenever you see Orion, oh, you know absolutely. you're in for a '90s treat. This unfortunately yes. did not start with Orion. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not the Paul Verhoeven you want. No, no, because there's great Paul Verhoeven. There's there is great Paul Verhoeven. Um, I feel like this might have been the start of the end of great Paul Verhoeven, right? They're like, this is after- Oh, I guess this is before Starship Troopers. Yes. But this is after Total Recall, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously after-, after Robocop. Th- yep, yep. And then, I mean, uh, I mean, Starship Troopers seems like an anomaly because then after that you have Hollow Man, <laughs> which is Show great. Girls. <laughs> Show Girls, yeah. God. <laughs> uh, it's strange, like, watching this movie, it's, it's weird to think that when it was made, Sharon Stone was not a household name. Because having grown up, like, I, I remember a world without basic instinct, but, like, this movie's been around for certainly the majority of my life. And yeah. it's so intertwined. Like, yeah, Sharon Stone, b- basic instinct, of course. Like, of course she was- in my head, I'm like, of course she was a thing. Yeah, yeah. But no, yeah. This, this was what really- she'd been around a while, but this is absolutely what launched her career. Yeah, yeah. I had, I had read, because I went through the trivia for- everything I could about this movie. They offered this part to well over 30 big, well-known actresses, and all of them said no on accounts of- It's soft porn. (laughs) Well, yes. She, I I have to say, though, and to give the film credit where it's due, she's fantastic in this movie. You can see why she became a star, because she is the only reason anything about this movie is remembered. She rocks. She is really She absolutely rocks in this film. Yeah, absolutely, because she- she does a great job of playing like all the different facets of this character. She actually makes this a character when it's it's not really very well written, but she she brings out all these different things that are individually really cool and come together in a really great way. She's fantastic. Like I'm not saying that her performance here measures up to Faye Dunaway in Chinatown, but yeah, that kind of thing where you just like, yeah, I I don't know about you. Every everything you say, I couldn't tell you if it's the truth or not. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you might be telling the truth just to, even though it's far fetched, just to mess with us. Yeah. Or you might be lying to us because you seem like the kind of person that would. Yeah. She's great. She's fantastic. And um, that's about where the cast ends for me because Michael Douglas, people, long time listeners of the show know that we don't like Michael Douglas. <laughs> No, this is not this is not the Michael Douglas Hyde. What what is what is he doing in this movie? He is like I feel like the, uh, I'm just, I'm so confused I can't even speak. Was he cast is is this character supposed to be an older gentleman? No, I think this is like when Tom Cruise plays a in quotation marks young man. I feel like the difference is though that Tom Cruise can or certainly could for a very long time actually pull that off. That's not something Michael Douglas can do. He looks about a thousand. He just seems commudgery. <laughs> like, yeah, like Douglas was born like sixty, wasn't he? Oh, absolutely. He looks old, yeah, like, half his career has looked older than his dad. Yes, he's he's never looked young. He's never looked young. I can literally think of two films that I've enjoyed him in: Falling Down, which I know you don't like. Absolute garbage. And is it garbage or just garbage? <laughs> no, that's flight garbage. <laughs> and the game. And the game. Which doesn't work because of Douglas, but he's he's good in it at least. I mean, yeah, the American president I'll give a pass to, but again, that's despite Douglas. Yeah. Not yeah. because of him. Yeah. But uh, like he is so gross and old in this movie. He's just he's <laughs> just he's very, very gross. <laughs> Uh, interesting. Um, you may well have seen this in your reading up on trivia of the film that the person who they originally had in mind when the script was being written was Kathleen Turner. Yeah, I could see that. In kind of a flip of her role in Body Heat from about 10 years earlier. Yeah. Um, Kathleen Turner's pretty great. She's fantastic. That that would have been interesting casting. Several things they could have done in this film. To make it interesting, uh, that <laughs> didn't happen. Uh, there's there's one really interesting scene in the in the film where Michael Douglas is in a nightclub wearing like oh a low God. cut okay. V neck. Okay, no. In fairness, in fairness, that like props <laughs> to this movie because I have not laughed so hard <laughs> in, a, in a really long time. I- both both Michael Douglas in his V neck. <laughs> I was already kind of had the giggles. Yeah, I know. But then it's it goes to a whole other level. When he, when he dances with Roxy's angry dancing. <laughs> it's, it's 
incredible. Like there is something about angry dancing that is so ridiculous. Like, like it just makes me think of like West Side Story, where it's like so over the top. Oh, it's like instead of saying, "Hey, keep your hands off my girlfriend," <laughs> gonna- she was like, "I could do this with interpretive tasks. <laughs> I'm gonna knight at the Roxbury towards you, and you'll know what I'm saying." <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbel- also unbelievable that, that a man of Michael Douglas's advancing years would be out at midnight. I know. He, he would have been it's asleep. It's specified. It's specified in the script that he's going to meet her at midnight. And I'm like, at the home that you clearly live in, Michael Douglas, they serve dinner at 4.45 in the afternoon and you'd be asleep for six hours before this scene takes place. When this movie was made, he would have been at least 10 to 15 years older than I am at this moment in time right now. I can't make it up to midnight. I can't even make it up to... 10 30 my, my wife finishes work at 10 30 and i will be sound asleep like a baby by the time she walks in the door <laughs> i was up till 1 a.m on saturday well sunday morning i guess that's wild and i was a i wasn't even dri- i was driving wow. and i was a wreck on sunday if i if i'm up that late then i'm getting cheeseburgers delivered that's the only time i'm up past midnight is is if we're getting cheeseburgers delivered <laughs> early on in this okay is there a greater sign of douchebaggery than having a mirror on your ceiling? Uh, yeah, sure. Obviously, that's that's intentional. Um, in fact, that's probably one thing that I'll give props to the film, that from that original first scene, you're just like, oh, right, you're a knob. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't much care if you get ice picked in the face. <laughs> it's pretty gratuitous, I guess, to have a mirror on your ceiling. Especially, like, if you bring home a date to that, they, they, know, they know what that means. <laughs> like... Nobody gets a mirror installed on their ceiling so they can watch themselves sleep. Let's put it that way. Well, that's famously hard to do. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to be honest here, and maybe it's because I'm a little bit overweight. I don't I don't want a mirror anywhere near me while I'm having the sex. <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like that would just be one of the worst things imaginable. Like, I'm trying to get turned on. I don't want to see what I'm doing. <laughs> can you imagine watching... Your body bounce around. <laughs> I don't care. How, like, <laughs> I don't care how attractive your partner is. You don't want to see that. I don't understand it. No, nah, no good. Do you know one thing? Like, there's some things in movies where we've talked about it before. Like, smoking on a plane. You know, great way of dating a film. Yeah. One thing in this film was like, oh wow. So this is actually set a while ago now. Um, just blatant littering. Yeah. If you do that now, you're an animal. Absolutely. Absolutely. You'll you'll get you'll get, you know, you'll get yelled at on the street for doing that. Rightly so. Yeah, absolutely. Dickheads. <laughs> so I guess here's the thing for me though. The opening scene, lots of sex, lots and lots and lots of different shots. It was pretty obvious to me that that was Sharon Stone. I, I wasn't sure that I was meant to feel ambiguous about it at all. That was that was clearly her, right? You see well, her face. <laughs> I was just going along with the film that, yes, it's it wants to point at the fact that it is without actually saying it. So I was just like, okay, I'll just go along with that. But isn't the point of the movie, isn't it supposed to be kind of a thriller, like, a, like, oh, did she do it? Did she not do it? What's going on here? But it's pretty clearly her, right? Yeah. Do you, do you think the film is, is any better if you don't, if you aren't convinced that it's her? I think it's actually probably more fun in its defense if you are just watching this maniac fuck with people for two hours. I guess. But do you think that that's the point of the movie? I feel I feel like the point of the movie was to be this like, oh, wow, was it her? Was it not her? I, I ooh, 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 who knows? Mm. And I suppose you'd have to be at all invested in Nicholas Karan for that to be the case, <laughs> which we're not. Yeah, I don't give a shit. <laughs> and okay, it, you know, props to the script here. The the setup with the, the author and the murder, same as in the book. It, it is a cool premise. I actually really like that premise. And I got to say, I was a pretty avid reader in the 90s, and I'm a big, like, Stephen King, Mark Crichton fan. I loved seeing the covers of those books. They made me want to read them. I wanted to read those actual books, and it made me real sad that they don't actually exist. Womp womp. 
wasn't the cover art so cool? Didn't it just remind you of reading in the 90s? Oh, it was very much of its time, wasn't oh, it? Oh, it really was. Like, that font, that font and that kind of slightly embossed different coloured lettering was so- it was everywhere. Can I call bullshit on something? Um, many things. Probably the full two and a half hours. <laughs> so, Nick Curran has to see this doctor because of an incident at work. Yeah. They know that he's been in a relationship of a sexual variety with with this doctor, but they're okay with that being the doctor he sees? Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. I didn't buy that at all. I What a load of crap. I know. Like, they would have other doctors, right? Like- she can't be the only one in San Francisco. Absolutely not. Well, no, I got the vibe that she she was actually like a police doctor. I didn't get the feeling that she worked as like an independent practice. I thought that she was like the forces doctor. But I still feel like they would have more than just her. Yeah, well, or if that is the case, then you just have to outsource it. Yeah, because there's no way. There's no way. Like, they had a prior relationship. That's that's not on. And, yeah. Ridiculous. It wasn't like it was a secret thing. I felt like it was explained that people knew that. Everyone at the bar clearly knew. Everybody knew Gene Triplehorn. So, I did, I did a lot of reading and trivia. And I got to say, I've quite enjoyed some Paul Verhoeven films in the past. This reading the trivia of this film, honest to God, made me uncomfortable because I was like, this guy is a straight up pig. <laughs> like, it, and enough of that comes across just in the watching of the movie. Like, it is, it is quite gratuitous. I don't know what copy you watched, but it turned out that the copy I had was the unrated edition, which has about, I don't know, six or seven extra minutes. And like, I don't know, this guy, it's, it's pretty nasty. Like the leg crossing scene, famous scene. That was not scripted. And not only that, she didn't know that that was being filmed. Like, that's next level, right? Yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. So, they were filming and she was meant to uncross her legs, but she was wearing knickers. And he came over and said, oh, they're reflecting, you know, the light into the lens. Can you take them off? And told her that it was fine. It wasn't being filmed. She didn't know until the premiere when she saw it. That's not on. And the scene between Michael Douglas and Gene Triplehorn where he- rapes her yes that, uh, yes he does yeah yeah Ra- rapes her um pretty nasty stuff that was rehearsal they they weren't meant to be filming but quote unquote the actors got so into it that they started rolling and it's like i feel like you mean michael douglas got into it because she's not she's not really meant to be into it and that's the vibe i got <laughs> Tri- yeah beth says and i quote no yeah Pretty clear. Yeah. Detective Curran. <laughs> and then it's like, I was reading stuff where it's like, um, Michael Douglas, at one point in the script, um, Curran is bisexual, which Michael Douglas was not all right with. He made them change that. <laughs> it's like, so, so, you so have you're the okay right with to- being a rapist, yeah. but not bisexual. Okay. Yeah, and also he has the right to tell them to take something sexual out of the script, but poor Sharon Stone has to show her snatch to the world. Verhoeven also wanted to add in a lesbian sex scene between Roxy and- What is Sharon Stone's character's name? I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, couldn't tell you. Anyway, Paul Verhoeven wanted to add one in, and the screenwriter was like, no, that doesn't work, that'll just slow everything down. And Verhoeven was like, no, they're going to do it. He filmed it and then was like- yeah, and no, it slowed everything down. <laughs> All right. And I wonder where where those film reels wound up. Yes. <laughs> Another thing that dates this film, it's been a while since smoking was sexy. Now it's like, fucking get some Nicorette. You're just killing yourself. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's true. What um, I'm actually trying to think of the last movie I saw where the lead characters, this is particularly like romance, where the lead characters smoked. I, honest to God, can't even think of one. House of Cards. But they do it when they're, co- they do it when they're concocting evil shit. So, like it's a part yeah, of yeah. So they're not meant to be good guys or sexy guys. Yeah. 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 I, I can't think of one. I can't, can you think of how many movies could be made worse? Just by, Can you imagine The Princess Bride just with Carrie Helwes and- Buttercup just smoking ferociously the whole time. I don't know if it was like you know Lord of the Rings style, and they're in, they got pipes. Well, even Lord of the Rings, they don't. They smoke. Well, you know, it's never specified what they're smoking in Lord of the Rings, but I think we all know. Yeah, 
Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, that's true. Gandalf is is pretty high. We've also we've, oh, we've all seen that ten hour video of him jamming his head to saxophone. <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> Beginning to end. I love that clip. <laughs> it's actually the greatest thing <laughs> it's, on ju- Earth. it's just time. Anyone so out there well. who doesn't know what we're talking about, <laughs> you need to Google Gandalf. Just If you Google Gandalf saxophone, you're on your way. And thank us later. <laughs> but what you, want, what you really want to look for is the 10-hour mix, because yeah. that's the one that really slaps. <laughs> Oh, my God. It's the best thing ever. (laughs) Uh, We've literally just had that running in the office before just for a full day. Just leave it up there. It's so good. It's the right thing to do. (laughs) Um, You want me to share another shit thing this film does? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always. So, Silence of the Lambs with the talking down the barrel. It's weird at first, but if you commit to it, it eventually just becomes part of the visual language of the film. And you actually just forget that it's happening not that far into it. Yes. And just to clarify, that's not fourth wall breaking a la Ferris Bueller. This is this is talking to another character, but the camera is almost being that other character. You're talking straight down the lens. Exactly. When this film does it, it does it for like two shots. Yeah. And it's just weird. Don't You can't just do it for two shots. Yes. It's like, imagine if you're watching a TV series and obviously- The way TV series are done, just about every episode in a season will have a different director. But there is still a showrunner who says this is the visual language of the show. And while you can play within that, this is the style. Yeah. I'm not saying that this flourish you want to do is bad. Yes. It's just not what this is. Yes. Now, can you imagine if randomly in episode seven of Game of Thrones, there was talking down the lens? (laughs) Unless it's explained for like, Unless there's actually a reason for it to take place within the story, it would feel really, really strange. And this is the same. When you do it for like one or two shots with no consistency, it just doesn't translate. And it's really, really off-putting. Yeah. Stupid. Fuck you, movie. And I must say, though, it is weird because one of the things I didn't hate about the film was the cinematography. I actually think for the most part, it's shot fairly well. It looks how this film should look. Yes. For what it's- Well- (laughs) <laughs> for the story they're trying to tell, for the vibe they're going for, this film looks correct. I agree. You know what else it does? It sounds correct. Have you ever heard a more atrociously 90s thriller soundtrack? <laughs> it sounded like Jerry Goldsmith was just taking cues from Mark Snow writing for the X-Files. Like, it was really, really in your face, like 90s thriller score. <laughs> Can I notch up another thing that just in my list of I have- I don't care if bad things happen to Nick. Yeah. He parks like an absolute animal at the medical (laughs) centre. Come on, man. You're a cop. You can drive a car. I really feel like I was expecting this to happen, and I think the movie would be better if it did. I thought he was going to die at the end, and I think that would make for a better movie because he's rubbish. I was really hoping. He's rubbish. She's really cool. Give me some payoff. And, like, I know that she's a murderer. I don't care. I like her. She's smart. (laughs) I'll take- Sharon the murderer over Nick the rapist any day. Yeah, look, and I don't know. I suspect that it's just Sharon Stone being awesome that makes her lines good. But she literally says lines that sounds like they were written better than the rest of the movie. That sequence when she's being interrogated and she's like, oh, yeah, I'm really I'm going to kill someone the same way that that my book, you know, did that. I'm not stupid. Like the way she delivers that actually elevates this movie. And also landed Dennis Nedry. <laughs> <laughs> being cast in Jurassic Park. Yes. This is this is where Spielberg saw him and was like, yes, that's my Dennis Nedry. So you so that's your pull for Newman. You don't say Newman, you say Dennis Nedry. Well no, I'm I'm saying specifically here that that's how he got Dennis Nedry. Well, yeah, but I mean that that guy's name is just Newman, right? Like nobody calls oh, him, nobody calls him Wayne Knight. His name is fucking Newman. No, Wayne Wayne Knight is not Wayne Knight. He's Newman. He's Newman. Like, and it was. I must say that was a perfect piece of casting for this, for this film because he he just like he oozes sleaze. Oh yeah, he's there like smacking <laughs> his lips and he is a disgusting man. And I say that with so much affection because that's what he's that's what he's meant to be doing. And you know he he's Newman. He's meant to be gross, but. <laughs> Great casting. <laughs> um, getting back to Nick to Nick's driving habits. Fucking idiot. <laughs> what, when he chases her in the car. So high speed car chase. Yeah. And then when she parks at a house, 
He's like, oh, I better stop back here in case she notices me. <laughs> what is that shit? Yeah, he's terrible. Like, she terrible. probably noticed oh. the other deranged driver, dickhead. Absolutely she noticed. And, and he's meant to be a cop. He's meant to be a cop. You'd think that he'd be good at tailing people. Nope. I, I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. So I, sa- I said that I wished the film had maybe been a little bit more ambiguous because for me, at least, I felt it was very obvious from the opening scene that she did it. Do you wish that the ending had been more ambiguous? D- did you did you feel it was ambiguous at all or do you think it was pretty wrapped up at the end? Uh, I don't think there's a lot of ambiguity there, no. No, absolutely not. Why do people talk? I was expecting, why do people talk about it like there is? Yeah, so I was I was vaguely aware of, of of yeah what you're talking about, and then I saw the ending of the film and I was like, what what I I don't understand yeah, because <laughs> while what questions were I, you left with? I know because while I haven't seen the film, it's one of those pieces of pop culture that's permeated. Like everybody knows a lot about this movie, and one thing I'd always heard was. And I, I'm yet to see it, and I, I dare say I won't because this was enough of a chore. I won't see the sequel, but I've heard a lot of people talk about how the sequel ruins this one because it takes away the ambiguity. And I'm like, what ambiguity, people? Like, it's it's very, very, very clear for the majority of the movie and certainly the end scene that she fucking did it. <laughs> Duh. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you felt the same way because- I was worried that maybe it had been ruined for me somehow, but I, I just, I felt like it was very wrapped up in a, in a little bow. What else is she doing with the ice pick? Well, yeah, right? What's the mystery there? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Fun fact, this film takes place in an alternate reality where there's no DNA testing. Yes, yes. That would have wrapped up the case pretty quickly. Yes, and of course, by this point in time, there actually was DNA testing. There absolutely was. So you're right with the alternate universe thing. They really did just have to ignore it and just pretend that it totally wasn't a thing. That's a pretty short movie. No shortage of DNA at that crime scene. Bodily fluids all over the shop. So remake of Basic Instinct. Oh, okay. Made made by- 2020 style. you, You and me, let's say. Yep. We're making Basic Instinct. Okay, yep. I'm, um, I'm writing, you're directing. Who's ca- uh, Who are you casting? Um, Michael Douglas. I think he's finally- I think he's gone full circle and now he can get away with playing a 25 year old. now. <laughs> he was. Um, no, look, it's got to be someone who can be despicable but also has to at least be a little bit likeable. Look, and I'm going to stick with the slightly older man thing but I'm going to do it intentionally- and I'm going to say Robert Downey Jr. Oh yeah, yeah. I feel yeah, I feel like he could pull off. He could be charming, but he can still be a little bit. Uh, this guy, this guy's a bit nasty. <laughs> um, he'd look better in a, in a low cut V neck, and you would you would at least kind of believe he could get into the club. Um, <laughs> so, and for Sharon Stone, oh, that's a really tough one. Because there's the obvious, you know, like you could go, Scarlett's a very good actress. Very, she could pull off that kind of femme fatale thing. I think the low-hanging fruit here is Margot Robbie. Yes, obviously Margot Robbie. And I was going to avoid her. I, I'm going to go a little bit left field. I'm going to go. I'm going to replace Jean Triplehorn with Linda Cardellini. And in place of Sharon Stone, I'm going to go, oh, this is really tough. <laughs> You, you tell me yours first. Um, I, I actually didn't walk past the low-hanging fruit. I just picked Margot Robbie. You're just going Margot. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then Oscar Isaac. Oh, I dig that. That's really good casting. In, in my imagination here, we're trying to make a good film. Yes, I could I could definitely see that. Oscar Isaac I think would Oscar be Isaac would be fantastic. He really would be. Yeah, he would be great. It, like in a good version of this film, not in this film. No, no, not in this film. Not in this film at all. Yeah, I really want. I really want to see that now. Yeah, and all you'd have to do to make the DNA testing work is fucking period piece it, mate. Make it set in the seventies, and it's instantly yeah. a better movie. It doesn't. It didn't. Yep. It didn't need to be set in the current time period. But like, they don't use mobile phones or anything. Set it in the seventies, and you've instantly solved your, your biggest, you know, plot hole. We should. We should get a ball rolling on this. Crowdfund it. <laughs> All right, how are you scoring this? I mean, we're Australian. We know Margot Robbie. Well, this is true. I mean, just throw a kangaroo and you'll hit her, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
how how am I scoring it? Look, there's there's a reason this film has basic in the title. Um, <laughs> it's it's really hard to imagine liking this if you didn't first see it as a twelve year old boy. Um, and I really, I truly mean that. I just I can't think of another path to enjoying this film unless that's how you first came to Look, it. Look, it's the same reason I still love Species. <laughs> like, Species ain't good, but, I mean, fuck, Natasha Henstridge, hell yes. I, I will watch Species till the cows come home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to generously, I think, give this a three out of ten. Yeah, I'm also a three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, and the thing is, yes, I could totally understand how somebody could like this film if you saw it as a 13-year-old boy. And it has- you have another relationship to this film, which we don't need to talk about, but you can imagine. <laughs> so I can I can understand, and I must say, like you were saying, even with the you know the TriStar logo at the start, there is kind of something about this film that gives you that kind of warm, fuzzy '90s thriller feeling. You know, so something about it, even if you hadn't, it's the same feeling I got watching Die Hard, even though I'd never seen it before. You still get a little bit of that nostalgic feeling like, oh, yeah, this is what movies were like back then. <laughs> Except Die Hard's a masterpiece and this sucks. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, yes, that's true. <laughs> all right. Three out, threes all round. So six out of 20 for basic instinct. That's not a recommend. No, no, it is not. <laughs> all right. What are we getting to next week, buddy? Next week, um, another request. Um, this one was made with just straight up telling us that they hate yeah, this Yeah, yeah. This was with malicious intent. <laughs> so Straight up the kind great. of patron who just wants us to watch garbage. <laughs> yes. Some patrons just want to watch the world burn. Look, and maybe maybe we'll disagree with them. I don't know. I, I, haven't, I haven't watched it yet. Have, have you seen it before? We're talking about 2016s. Is it a cure for wellness? Yeah, let's see about that next week. Maybe our patron's wrong. All right. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, you can do that at wewatchthething.com or wewatchthething at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under the handle at wewatchthething. If you want to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchthething, and we will catch you next week. See ya. I amuse myself far more than this movie did. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah.